Well, Sam, welcome to the Iron Life Podcast, man. I really appreciate you taking time out of your day to come on the show. I appreciate it, Chris. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, man. I'm excited to talk to you today. Uh, why don't we kick this off? Let's let's start with uh, a little bit of a background on you. Tell everybody, you know, who you are, what you do, where you're from, all that good stuff. Yeah, of course. <clears throat> so I am originally from, uh, born in New York, so just a stone's throw from from Chris in Jersey, but uh, currently located in Raleigh, North Carolina. I've been a health and fitness professional, primarily working with both clients and coaches for over the last 15 years, and recently released a book last year, Metabolism Made Simple, which kind of takes a lot of my key ideas, frameworks, and life experiences and distills it down into really that text and my attempt to simplify uh, what is pretty complex, which is human physiology and metabolism. My interest in health and fitness really started as a combination of both my own journey to get healthier. And also I had some very close family members who experienced some uh, life-changing sort of health-related complications. And it sparked my interest in, in learning that there was a little bit more to meets the eye than what we typically see in magazines or news media or, you know, on your favorite, you know, good morning TV show. And I started to kind of explore different avenues in health and fitness, got really into strength training in my teenage years. And that was a pretty formative experience for me and kind of lucked out that I had some both good coaches and uh, some changes in my life, including a pretty significant head injury that just led me down that continued path of education as it pertains to nutrition, metabolism, and obviously continuing to emphasize the importance of movement and strength training. So I've really spent you know over a decade working with clients either in their own journey to get healthier or perform better uh, or look better, you know, for a vacation or a wedding or whatever it is that they're, they're training for also work with athletes as well. And uh, through those experiences realize that a lot of times in the industry, we may uh, tell people what to do, but we're not always telling them why they're doing it or, or the how uh, and some of the key reasons and rationale that maybe make things more sustainable for people in their journey. And I'm sure as you've experienced, Chris, there's not always necessarily one right way to do things. I think it depends a lot on the individual and the person. And we figure out a way to optimize their training or we figure out a way to optimize their nutrition, whether it's around their family life, their work life. Um, so there's so many things that go into having a well-designed program and a quality approach for the individual. And so I really wanted to take, you know, my career and kind of think about, okay, how do we help people think about the problems related to nutrition and training and think about their goals and begin to tailor a solution based on the season of life that they're in. But that's a little bit on my background and kind of what sparked my interest and uh, why I'm kind of doing the work that I'm doing today. That's awesome, dude. And and were you when you were working with, or you said you know you've been doing this for for quite a while, working with all different types of people. Were you mainly working on the nutrition side of things, or were you also working you know as a trainer as well, or both of those things? Yeah, the great question. So I actually did a lot of personal training in my early years for sure. I I think on the floor in person gym experience is invaluable for anyone who wants to be a coach, even if that's not what you want to do long term. Even doing it part time just to get your feet wet, even if you have another job or you have another pursuit in a health and fitness profession, even if you want to coach nutrition, I would still encourage you to learn about training and even spend some time on the gym floor. So I actually, I think in order of operations, I may have even gotten my personal training certification prior to nutrition. So I was definitely training for quite some time. And that was like my main side hustle in college. I actually worked at uh, the university campus recreation while I was getting my bachelor's of science. So I saw all different shapes and sizes of people, all different walks of life, all different backgrounds, different movement capacity, different uh, motivation levels, you know, people who are, who are young and athletic and, uh, you know, excited to go to the gym and then people who kind of dread it, or they were in a lot of pain or they were uncomfortable or uh, maybe health and fitness had, hadn't always been uh, something that they were passionate about. So I, I was very fortunate to get some in the trenches, personal training experience early on, also had uh, some good mentors. And so that that time on the gym floor was very important for me. I did morph towards adopting more of an emphasis in terms of my speaking and my content is very nutrition focused, but I still try to match and consider the stimulus of training with any time we're talking about nutrition related considerations. So today, a lot of the education that I do, the speaking that I do, the podcast that I have, it is geared towards nutrition. So you're completely correct um, as far as that avenue goes. But earlier on in my career, it just started with coaching people. And a lot of times, you know, that involves both training and nutrition. 
but uh, certainly, you know, part of that origin story was really in the gym and working with people on the gym floor, even, you know, wiping down the treadmills too, is I, I just started wherever I could and then eventually uh, progressed to doing things online uh, over time. Yeah, dude, I, I couldn't agree more. I think that, you know, there's there's so much value in working with people, you know, skin to skin, face to face, um, in the trenches, getting that experience, especially early on. I think there's so many online coaches these days that they're just like, you know, they're they're these young kids that want to just they want to become a trainer or a coach and they want to go right into online and start doing online programming. And when people, you know, when they ask me about it, I'm like, dude, you got to work with people face to face first and got get that. to understand these different nuanced details that go into each individual, right? It could be within their programming, their lifestyle, or just something just because, you know, you read it in a textbook and it makes total sense doesn't mean that that's going to apply to every person, right? There's, there's so much nuance to it. So I, I'm glad that you said that. I couldn't agree more. And I think that carried over into how I teach now. So working with health professionals, you know, I can take someone who's nutrition only. I can take someone who's a cross was a, had a CrossFit background, someone who's a strength and conditioning coach, people who work with, uh, you know, I've even been fortunate enough to work with Olympia competitors who are IFBB pros. So lots of different backgrounds. But once you've interacted with individuals in their transformation in person, you begin to understand the importance of certain concepts that aren't always emphasized in the textbook. So I'm a big believer and proponent of talking with clients about their biofeedback, things like their energy levels, their hunger, their, di their digestion, their recovery. How did you sleep last night? Because we've all, you know, if you're a personal trainer or strength and conditioning coach, or you, you know, do something in a gym, you've had that client who comes in after a shitty night's sleep, or, you know, maybe their, their kids were up all night or they had a stressful day at work that training session doesn't always go the same way that you intended in your head on paper when you you know looked at your textbook and you were like oh yeah we're going to follow this progression model and we're going to do this and we're going to do this you know some days you're just trying to like hit maintenance volume and they're going to drag the sled for a little bit and do low injury risk activities and like get them moving and and maybe do a little bit of like dynamic stuff but i i i really value that experience because now when i go to teach i understand okay this is what we experience uh, interacting with this person face to face, and how do we have to translate that communication online to emphasize the importance of these variables? Because it's, you know, to me and probably to you, Chris, like if you've seen that person in the gym, it's common sense that when some of these things are compromised, it's going to impact performance, it's going to impact recoverability, it's going to impact, you know, across the week what's happening uh, for their training. But if you've never interacted with someone in person, you wouldn't have seen that change in real time. Like you can literally see a change in their bar speed, right? Or like the quality of their form or the safety of their movement or uh, the zest that they're kind of moving through their day, right? You literally, you like physically almost like absorb their energy in, in their interaction. When you're a coach, you're, you're in the same container as them uh, kind of feeling that out in real time. And so I think it's important that when we do move to online coaching and having a conversation around that, or even things that are related to, you know, books and education related to health, fitness, and nutrition, that we have an understanding for how things do play out in the real world and how we integrate that science and some of the more theoretical stuff with the actual practical, uh, you know, real time play by play of that client interaction. I totally agree, man. And uh, and speaking of the book, uh, your book, Metabolism Made Simple, I didn't read the entire thing yet, but I've been skimming through it. And I mean, it's really awesome information here. I think everybody should grab a copy of this for those of you guys watching here. It's Metabolism Made Simple, Making Sense of Nutrition to Transform Metabolic Health. Um, and one thing, Sam, that you talk about in the book, uh, one of the first things is doing away with diet culture. And I think you know, just to, to make sense of that for everybody, like what, what does that mean? And, you know, what is the big issue with, you know, uh, so-called diet culture? Yeah. When I think about diet culture and also a lot of the way that I'd say a lot of nu nutrition books, right? You buy the book and maybe it talks a little bit about nutrition, but really what we have, if you were to scroll through Amazon is a lot of diet books. It's a, it's an author who found a diet that worked for them and maybe some of their clients and they're a proponent of that eating style. And so as a result of being a fan of that eating style, they then 
perpetuate that into the industry and they that's kind of their their claim to fame it's their stance it's the hill that they want to die on and so rather than writing a book about one thing that worked for me or this one approach that worked for a client i wanted people to understand why these different approaches work and the like the inner workings of like how or the mechanism of what's leading these people to success and so when I talk about doing away with diet culture, it's really like, okay, let's pause for a second. You know, this book isn't going to give you a diet at the end. There's no meal plan. You're not going to cut this out and put it in your kitchen and instantly have to follow these recipes. I actually want you to think for a second. And diet culture to me is, number one, there's a lack of periodization and seasonality to your approach. So just like with training, you know, your audience probably has a little bit of a familiarity with that based on what you talk about and your expertise. But with training, we we have sort of these different seasons or cycles or areas of focus or things that we might work on over a given, whether it's a block, uh, month, 12 weeks, you know, three to six months, we, we have sort of an intentionality to what we're doing. And unfortunately, people think of nutrition, because it can be day to day at times, you know, I'll see men and women who have spent a significant chunk of their adult life always on a diet. And the problem with that is we're not spending a season with any type of focus building strength. We're not uh, working on actually, you know, eating at maybe maintenance calories to to support quality of life and energy levels and recovery and, and the work that we're doing in the gym. Uh, that's especially important for athletes for mitigating injury risk and things like that. So when I talk about doing away with diet culture, it's really multifaceted. One is, Hey, like this book, isn't going to have a printout diet at the end Two, We need some seasonality in our nutrition. We can't, we, we need to have some planning, have some periodization, even if it's not the most scientific thing in the world. And then three is just doing away with diet culture is that most people see a diet on TV or their favorite celebrity following something or eliminating carbs or whatever. And they decide to follow that person. And that's kind of the culture that we see is they, they hop from fad diet to fad diet versus adopting an approach that works best for them and their preferences and their activity level. And so that's, that's kind of how I wanted to start and frame the book. Uh, and really my core tenets of, you know, doing away with diet culture. I love that, dude. I, I think the idea of having seasonality in your approach to nutrition is, is so important for so many reasons. And maybe just share a few things like, for example, let's say somebody is in a, a calorie a calorie restricted diet or a calorie deficit for maybe 24 months of the, uh, you know, two years in a row, they're just following some type of um, calorie restriction protocol because their goal is to lose body fat, right? And let's just say they're, they're eating very low calories and they're they're exercising frequently that type of person how does that affect their overall metabolism and how can that be problematic for everybody listening yeah so if you take the person or avatar that's been pursuing weight loss for 24 months there's a couple things that are happening number one i would almost guarantee that out of those 24 months we weren't successfully in a deficit for the entire two-year period and the body has ways of adapting and basically becoming a bit more thrifty or frugal with our energy expenditure the longer we continuously try to pursue a diet. So I talk about how you know the deliberate pursuit of a calorie deficit is not a bad thing. It's the perpetual pursuit of a calorie deficit that's a bad thing. So it's okay to go in for 12 weeks and say, hey, I've got this goal. I want to you know, look a little bit better, make my body composition improve. I want to improve my progress photos. I want to look a little leaner. I want these clothes to fit better. I'm going to improve my insulin sensitivity and other aspects of my health. But, you know, we take that to an extreme. Number one, it becomes harder to actually hit that target deficit that you have because you're you're extending the, the time horizon of, of what you're trying to do. And, and even the strongest individuals with a ton of willpower in their approach there's a certain level of almost like diet fatigue that can happen. And we also tend to see those people where it's like maybe five days of the week, they're going super low with their calories, but then on the weekend, they're a little bit more loose with what they're doing. And so rather than just having a little bit more uh, of evenness or balance in their approach, they they tend to gravitate towards those extremes. And then, you know, they feel like they're they're never really able to fully enjoy a maintenance phase, but they're never really fully out of a diet. So the first thing I would say is, over a two-year period, probably 
would be really hard. That that would be your someone who's just like, I'm going to blunt force trauma my way to like a 1200 calorie. And, and they're probably very on point with their tracking, very meticulous for that individual. Who's actually pursuing the deficit. We have what's called metabolic adaptation, which is a part of our body's metabolism and adaptive physiology. And what that means is our body has hormonal and metabolic changes or down regulations that are, they're largely transient as a result of eating less where our body will conserve energy. And so instead of, you know, moving more for non-exercise activity or having the best session in the gym, our body kind of throttles that down a little bit. And what ends up happening as a result is when you think about calories in and calories out, even though we may be adjusting or modulating or controlling and titrating our calories in, we're actually burning far less on the energy expenditure side. And that's because our body has um, adapted or downregulated to, you know, our new level of consumption versus our status quo or maintenance. So the more that we push that calorie gap and the higher our stress is and training that we have, we do have to be cognizant. And that's where seasonality can be very helpful in our approach is it sort of mitigates the degree to which we may experience that metabolic adaptation. So met metabolic adaptation, isn't this like big, scary thing that people make it out to be. It's more of a transient change. Your body is supposed to do it. It's a natural physiological response how we avoid it is through seasonality in our approach and just intelligent nutrition and training. And it's not, uh, it's, it's not all bad. I think people view it, you know, we see terms like broken metabolism or metabolic damage or all these things. I, I don't like that because it ingrains a fixed mindset in the client that they can never change it. It's really more important that we just understand this is largely a result of our actions and decisions and health behaviors. And we actually control what the degree to which this happens. So when we think about that, uh, that metabolic adaptation, just think about the depth, the duration, and the frequency of your diets. And that usually will help explain the degree to which you're experiencing that metabolic adaptation uh, from dieting. So that 24 month individual, probably chronic dieter, they're probably dealing with some nutrient deficiencies, probably have low energy, it's starting to probably show up in terms of their quality of life. You know, maybe not setting those PRs in the gym like they used to, maybe sleep isn't as good as it used to be. Uh, we start to see elevations in certain stress hormones, uh, so things like cortisol, and that's not really optimal for body composition. So that's kind of the avatar of the chronic dieter, and there's a couple of ways we can sort of get out of that, but those are uh, some of the more common cases I think we see for people who are perpetually burning the candle at both ends. Got it. Now, are there a few things that people could do, maybe a checklist or something like that, to see maybe they did run into some metabolic dysfunction or they're dealing with something along those lines? Is it really just, you know, some of the things you just mentioned, like sleep, et cetera, or is there something specific that you like to kind of follow as a protocol? Yeah. So for biofeedback and quality of life indicators of those metabolic changes, I really like to use an acronym called SHREDS, which stands for Sleep, Hunger, Recovery, Energy, Digestion, and Stress. And you can rate these one to five. You can also kind of think about them qualitatively. But if you've been dieting for a period of time, your stress is pretty high, your sleep is pretty low, and you notice your recoverability starts to tank, that could be indicative that uh, maybe we need to think about a different phase for a little bit. The example I would use is, let's say you've got like a newborn at home or something, and your biofeedback is pretty trash. It might just make sense to move to a different phase or season of your nutrition uh, if you're sleeping great, your stress is managed, you're performing great in the gym. Yeah. You know, a few hundred calorie deficit to try to work on your body compositions, probably no problem. So that's kind of my favorite checklist for just auditing how that diet may be affecting you. Now, I do think we have to be honest with ourselves as well, that, you know, following a diet and training hard is hard work and it's, it's okay to work hard and, and feel tired sometimes, but we need to think about the extremes. So it's when we push that envelope a little bit too far or if we've been, let's say we've been dieting 6, 12, 18, 24 months, we're not seeing those results that we're looking for. It's probably a time to, you know, and one of the things I mentioned in the book is that's a great time to hire a coach and really evaluate what's going on under the hood because something's probably not adding up. If you're putting forth that effort that you genuinely believe you're working hard and you are monitoring those variables and we're not seeing a lot of forward progress, that's probably a problem. So my checklist for everyone is, is to use shreds if those are kind of out of whack after a certain point and you're unsure of what to do, that's really where the value of a coach can come into play. Um, but other than that, other than shreds, really my biggest question for individuals is before you embark on your next diet, think about the depth, duration, and frequency of your past diets. So if you 
recently dieted, or you were in a place of very low calories, or let's say over the last year, you've already done five diets, it's probably not time to diet again versus let's say you spent the last eight months at maintenance. You might actually have a really successful diet phase because you haven't dieted super recently. Your body's a little bit more receptive to the stimulus of the calorie deficit. So I like to take that approach. Um, I also mentioned things like the seasons of nutrition in the book and also the five M's of managing metabolism. So those are all things we can talk about today in terms of ways to, to manage and navigate this. But if you're experiencing this yourself, really looking at those quality of life indicators can be one of the, uh, the greatest sort of things to do, uh, as well as just kind of auditing where you're at in your transformation. And if you're not already, I would really encourage you to, you know, keep like a seven day food log, uh, because some people think they're on a diet, but maybe they haven't really tracked uh, their food before. So depending on if you're beginner, intermediate, advanced, the advanced individuals probably tracking their macros, they're probably pretty dialed in with that, maybe even using a food scale or controlling their portions. The newer individual, if you're not aware of those things and you're not feeling super great, I track your food first and see what's going on before you go ahead and and drastically change everything that you're doing. But if you're more advanced, think you've got your things dialed in and and those factors and variables start to slip, it's probably an indication that we need to maybe toggle some things. Yeah, man. You've mentioned if you have a newborn at home, and uh, I do. <laughs> so uh, my son is now three and a half months. I told you about that, you know, the last time we spoke. And um, sleep has been like non-existent for me. It's been pretty brutal. And I think, you know, the the one of the biggest things for me is like, to auto-regulate, you know, like it doesn't mean like right now I'm not in a fat loss phase regardless. Right. But, you know, I think just focusing one on quality of your, the, the quality of the foods that you're eating, consuming quality nutrients, um, but also just auto-regulate, like listening to your body. If you feel a little bit more hungry today, maybe you eat a little bit more during a phase like that. It doesn't mean you have to go off the rails. It doesn't mean you have to go to McDonald's and you know just consume a ton of shit calories, but just eat well and just kind of, for, for lack of a better, better term, listen to those hunger cues, listen to your body and you know kind of just eat and do the same thing in your training, right? Like for me, there's days, if I'm getting good sleep, I'm going to battle if you're going to the gym. These days, I'm just... I'm going, walking in, getting a good warm up, breaking a little sweat, get a little pump, just kind of auto regulating based on how I feel. And if I do happen to get a good night's sleep, then I could go to work if I feel good that day, you know, but it doesn't have to be all or nothing. I think that's where a lot of people get stuck. Um, they think that they either have to be all in and going balls to the wall with calorie restriction, hard training, or they're not, and they're not doing anything. They're either going off the rails with their nutrition or they're just sitting on the couch whatever just depends on the individual. But, um, you know, from your experience, would you agree to that? Um, how would you kind of play into some of that stuff? Yeah, I'm definitely a big believer of auto regulation. I just don't know that everyone has, you know, you have a great experience level and you're a seasoned individual with a lot of time under the bar and very extensive training history. You're familiar with nutrition. You've worked with a lot of people. I think auto regulation for an advanced person is fantastic. I think if you're in that intermediate realm, I would encourage you to try it out. If you're a beginner, this is where the value of a coach comes in because they can help you auto-regulate. Mm -hmm. You can communicate how you're feeling and then the coach can help sort of assess and situate, okay, to what degree is this based on the lack of sleep or is this is this a normal response to the training that we're doing? Um, one of my favorite things to do, whether it's lost sleep or travel or different things coming up and constraints in life, or maybe you get sick or something, um, you know, coming back and, and maybe approaching it, maybe you just change your reps and reserve or your RPE, or maybe instead of uh, a total number of working sets you had, maybe, maybe you just do 80% of that or, or your overall volume just shifts a little bit. Um, I've, I've been kind of bouncing back from, you know, I recently traveled to uh, an event for a mutual, mutual friend and mentor of ours. And, on the way back is like, I got here, I wasn't feeling super great. And so the first couple of days back, it, it was a little bit lighter for me, but I still wanted to maintain the consistency in my approach. So I do think auto regulation is big. I think consistency is huge. We just need to have the the tools and education in our tool belt to auto regulate appropriately. 
And so that's where some of the models come in, right? And, and some of the things that I talk about, if you are hungry and you're sleep deprived, you know, start with protein and also make sure, you know, you're, you're taking time at mealtime, chewing your food, uh, consider your meal spacing, you know, not letting your blood sugar have crazy crashes or dips, you know, looking at all of that across the day. And so if I were coaching with someone, I could say, okay, this is why we're seeing this increased hunger. Or maybe you haven't trained in a while when you were lacking sleep and then you got back in the gym and now all of a sudden getting back in the gym is what's increasing the appetite. So understanding the drivers for the cluster of symptoms you're experiencing can be really powerful, but I do agree. Auto-regulation is a great tool, especially intermediate to advanced individuals. The type of auto-regulation we might do, I'm probably more likely to push on the uh, training auto regulation for nutrition. I think we need some buffers or, or almost like in bowling, they have like the bumpers that go up so that you can't throw a, a gutter ball. I do think we need a little, some type of guiding parameter to keep, to keep people on track because nutrition can be a little bit hard. And sometimes food is almost like a gateway drug to other foods. So I do put a couple other things in place, but we're going to make sure, yeah, we're, we're dialing in the protein and then yeah, maybe we ship the carb intake or, or maybe, you know, with the quality foods that we're eating, we understand, okay, well, when my training intensity goes up, I've got to be really mindful maybe of that uh, total daily intake or post-workout meal. So I agree. We, we can have some flexibility. I'm, I'm very much of that mindset that a lot of things in health and fitness, there's a gray area and some nuance to the conversation. Very rarely is it black or white. Um, and, and auto regulation is a great example of that. I think it can be deployed very intelligently. Sometimes we just need a teacher or a helper to, to help us feel through the best way to, to deploy that, you know, for us individually. Got it. Got it. Oh, I love that, man. And, um, one thing that you talked about in the book, which I think that so many people overlook this, this is something I've been really trying to harp and teach my clients for years now. Um, and that is the the importance of stress management, right? And easier said than done, obviously. We have a lot of different stressors in our life. But let's talk a little bit about um, about stress, about cortisol, and how those things uh, will affect the fat loss process. And just yeah, overall, overall health as well. Yeah, so stress stress is interesting, right? Because I think when when we have stress, a lot of times in the health and fitness industry, it's all stress is perceived as bad. Stress essentially can create an alertness response for our body. So in a very acute environment, stress is actually a good thing. It's, it's helping us prepare and be ready for some sort of stimulus in our environment. In fact, training is a stressor or, you know, you see some of the health and fitness trends going around right now, like cold therapy, super popular, sauna is super popular. Those are hormetic stressors. They're actually stressors on the body that end up being good over the long haul. So we got to unpack the word stress a little bit. And stress can come from different areas of our lives, both perceived stress. So that might be something from work or our relationships. We may have stress associated with sleep loss or circadian, you know, biology related changes, which is basically like, you know, if Chris right now is experiencing sleep loss from having a newborn, that's more of a, a circadian related stressor. It's not that all of a sudden he got 74 stressful emails that are, you know, making him freak out complete. It's a little bit different in terms of what's happening there. And then we also have to think about our current state of metabolic health can be a stressor. So if we are overweight or obese and have a fair amount of fat tissue or adipose tissue that contributes to a state of insulin resistance, that in itself is a stressor on the body and creates a very inflammatory environment. Another large center of stress for individuals is more gut centered stress in the, in the way that it can deplete micronutrient status. It can elevate inflammation and also activates the immune system. Uh, which, you know, small amounts of activating your immune system, that's natural. Like if you're exposed to something or you go out in the environment, that's, that's fine. We just don't want that chronic activation, just like that chronic stress. So when I talk about stress, I try to like subdivide it for clients to get them to understand where, where is the stress coming from? And then there's a variety of different ways to manage your stress ranging from creative therapies. You know, some people, you know, you like to draw or it could be music. Other people prefer breath work or uh, mindfulness or journaling. And for other people, it's just going for a walk in nature or spending time with pets. There's there's really a lot of evidence-based ways to manage our stress. And part of it is we don't want it to really feel like homework. We just want it to shift us out of that rumination mode of having a lot on our mind or feeling that kind of fight or flight reaction and just helping us kind of be in the present moment. And so I've had clients 
some people, you know, they love to draw. So it's like, let's get a coloring book for other people. It's, you know, I feel the best when I get out in nature, you know, with uh, my dogs or something, or maybe, uh, you know, it could be sports for some people. There's a lot of different ways to approach it, but a, a couple ways to just ask and figure that out. If you're working with someone is, Hey, what brings joy to your weeks or what brings joy to your life? Um, what did you enjoy doing as a kid or young adult before you had all of these adult responsibilities that you have now? Um, I think that that can really help us to think about our stress management. And so as far as I'll kind of wrap that up with the implications of stress on our transformation. And then additionally, just a brief note, which is life is not without stress. So I don't want people to think they can never achieve their body composition goals because they have a stressor presence. Uh, I think stress when tied to passion and purpose is very different than stress from, let's say a toxic relationship or a bad environment or a you know, uh, someone who's not really a good friend, or maybe you have, um, you know, other, other hardships in your life. There's some interesting concepts from other cultures about, you know, passion and purpose and, and that having that stressor. And it, it's almost a, it's so tied to meaning in life. I think it, it can be very hard to separate. So if that comes from a career or occupation that really gives you a lot of, uh, purpose and drive and, and uh, you have a lot of care for your craft and what you do. I think as long as we're we're taking care of our bodies, whether that be through sleep, training, nutrition, and and appropriately, you know, modulating that stressor, I think that's fine. I don't want people to think that to accomplish their body composition goals, they need to live in a vacuum. I don't think that's realistic. As far as the actual implications of stress on a transformation, really where that begins to show up is usually sleep, and then sometimes changes in eating behaviors. Because stress makes us a little, you know, when we experience a stressor, it makes us more stress reactive to future stressors. It can also impact our blood sugar a little bit, drive different sort of changes in our meal by meal decision making. And if we have high stress, especially in the evenings, cortisol sort of works in opposition to melatonin, which is a sleep promoting hormone. So if you're really running kind of redlining, and uh, you're, you know, or you're wired and tired, and you're experiencing a lot of those symptoms, the stress is showing up mostly in impacting your sleep and recovery. Uh, cortisol is also a, ca a catabolic hormone as opposed to a anabolic hormone. So it's really more so responsible for breaking things down in the body versus building things up. So if your goal is to like build as much muscle as possible, stress management is important because when not managed appropriately, it, it will begin to wreak havoc on some of those body composition changes. I think some people may over uh, kind of overstate what's actually going on in terms of cortisol, but I think for the average real world individual, what's happening in their lifestyle, probably the three biggest things, it's showing up with their sleep, probably showing up in terms of the quality of their training and output and probably meal by meal decision making and maybe some considerations related to blood sugar and hunger management as well got it and, and we can mitigate some of those 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 um those things with the things that you talked about right going for a walk spending time with with a pet or whatever it is but you know i think yeah. just just highlighting something to do within your day-to-day -day practice to try to mitigate some of those fat those factors there because I, you know, I think that it just becomes very overlooked and I agree with everything that you said there as far as stress and that it's going to be a, a part of your life in one way or another. However, knowing that, you know, this is, it is a factor in uh, whether it be a fat loss process or if you want to build muscle, so whatever the goal is, but it is a factor that, that should be addressed and part of your lifestyle in some way to try to mitigate that. Um, you know, like, and, and, and again, that could come in, that could look very differently for you than it does for me, but whatever it is that you enjoy, where you could get a little bit of peace of mind, even if it's just for a few minutes a day, I think that's super important. Yeah. Stress management comes in all different flavors, shapes, and sizes, and there's not a one size fits all approach for everyone. Also remember some of the basic things that actually are needed in a transformation like resistance training or walking, you know, movement in general is very protective as far as against future stressors. So we have studies to support the notion that when we resistance train, we're actually more resilient to future stress. So we're not trying to, we're not going to like skip our foundational fitness principles, 
when we think of a stress management activity, this should probably be something in your life in addition to your training or your movements that's contributing to your overall state of, you know, mental and emotional health. And uh, like Chris said, it can be pretty varied across the client base. Really, a lot of that's going to depend on, you know, how you were raised, what your personal preferences are, what you enjoy, what your family dynamic is. Um, that can, you know, all influence those things. But I think a, a key aspect too is understanding that exercise in itself uh, will help to buffer against those stressors. Now, I don't think people, uh, you know, there's the phrase where people are like, oh, training's my therapy and and all these different things. Definitely train. It's going to make you more resilient to other stressors, but having some of these other items in your life can be a great tool. It's also more parasympathetic, whereas training is actually a pretty sympathetic activity and, and you get a little bit more wound up versus having an opportunity to kind of get more into that rest or digest state, which is important as well. Totally. Love that, man. Now, here's something that you highlighted in the book, and um, you know, it caught my eye because this is again, this is another thing that I've I've talked about in the past, and that is right now, in the way that the world is, we have more accessibility to gyms than ever before. However, obesity rates are at an all time high. Tell me a little bit about how we, how can we explain that? Yeah. So I think a lot of it does have to do with nutrition and also non-exercise movement. And I think even though gym, the actual real estate footprint of gyms has changed, I don't know that the intelligent engagement and participation in gym related activities has really gotten that much better. So as an example, just because there are, you know, there, there are some models of gyms like larger big box gyms where they're financial model is let's get as many people to sign up as, as we can. And we're banking on like half of them not showing up. Let's hope they don't show up. Otherwise, let's hope they don't show up. Otherwise our equipment costs and maintenance is going to go through the roof and we actually don't have room for all these people. So there's a couple of variables here. One, I think our nutrition has changed immensely, even as the prevalence of gyms has increased Two, I think a lot of us have sedentary jobs. So there's a little bit uh, less non-exercise movement. Three would be, despite the increased footprint of gyms, a lot of those gyms bank on people not coming and they're not really working on actively engaging their customers and participating in fitness. And, uh, you know, on, on top of that, I would probably say is the lifestyle stuff, the the sleep deterioration, the stress, um, you know, lack of even things like community and, and relationships, there's there's a lot of things that play into health, but mm -hmm. I'd say the primary three, probably tying in movements. Yes, there's more gyms, but are people actually participating, engaged and following an intelligent program? I don't necessarily know about that. And then, you know, nutrition, obviously playing a key role. Anytime we're talking about body composition and uh, weight gain, we have to talk about the food that we're eating. Absolutely, man. And it's just, it's one of those things too, that I think, you know, at least from the, for the people that I work with, you know, we have a lot of many different types of people who come into our gym, right? So we have o over 200 members from all walks of life. And, you know, no matter how much we try to educate our clients and, you know, how much information we want to put out there and teach them how to do this stuff correctly, there's still this resistance to whether it be why I'm not losing weight or why I'm not seeing progress. And, you know, looking at some of these lifestyle variables or looking at certain, you know, nutrition protocols that we're talking about today, there's still this reluctance or there's this resistance to actually embracing some of the stuff that we're talking about today because there's like, it, it can't be true because my friend did keto and my friend lost 30 pounds or that can't be true. I can't eat carbohydrates for this reason or that reason. And it's like, man, what can we do better, right? In this industry as, as leaders in the industry, what can we do to help people actually see the truth actually and want to embrace these ideas and get through to the other side? And some people do, right? But I, I don't know, you know, like everything that we're talking about here, it's like, can, how the hell can we get people to kind of embrace some of these ideas and actually see real progress and sustainable progress. That's the other thing, right? There's a lot of people that will do a 30 day thing, a six week thing, a 90 day thing and make a lot of progress in a short period of time. 
but how many people actually create sustainable results for the long haul? What the hell could we do, Sam? I think as professionals, one of the issues is, I think some of it is integrity and ethics in our marketing process. And unfortunately, with social media, it does run a little bit rampant where people will, you know, I mentioned kind of earlier that scene of we're standing on the hill of what worked for us or our clients. Mm -hmm. And as much as those people may genuinely believe in their methods, sometimes what we see, especially in the nutri nutrition space, especially, is we're arguing for the sake of polarity to draw attention to get engagement on our account. And when we do that, it's what creates this vehement opposition and approaches to where people are like exactly the way you described it. Oh, it can't be this because so-and-so said this, or, oh, it can't be that instead of if we provide education, that's, this is why this works and approaching from that angle instead of contributing to the problem. And, and I totally understand there's a, there's a nature of, you have to be able to reach people. You have to be able to market to some extent to bring them in the front door. If they never reach your digital doorstep, it's very hard to help someone. I understand there has to be a little bit of engagement there and buy-in at, at, at kind of the top, you know, first level encounter. I understand that. But sometimes the way it's done is at such an extreme that that's why people, well, oh, I've got to do carnivore. Oh, I've got to do keto or plant-based or no, I need to follow, you know, this, pre this preset meal system or I need to be on this shake diet and just have one, you know, one meal a day or whatever. I think part of it is the professionals and the way that we're talking about nutrition and educating on it first and foremost. Uh, secondly, I think is when people understand how these approaches work for someone, understanding the general principles of nutrition and just how we you know, teach health education and nutrition education is important. Because if I understand that the reason Kevin was successful on keto is because he reduced his calories compared to when he was an omnivore, well, that makes sense as far as how he achieved the result. But if I don't understand how he achieved the result, and I think that there's some sort of magic in the name of the diet, uh, that's the problem. Because then if Sally heard about Kevin and she goes and eats a bunch of, uh, you know, bacon and is cooking, you know, with like triple the amount of oil or butter that she should, and she's exceeding her, her energy intake relative to energy expenditure, then keto might not work for her. So I think as much as you may be passionate about a given approach, we still need to understand the underlying science behind how things work. And part of that really starts with the leaders in the industry and the professionals and and just not contributing to that noise or that problem. Uh, but it, it's challenging, especially when mainstream media and, and large news media outlets and even larger than social media influencers, but literally like the morning talk shows have celebrities on there who have no no concept of nutrition, educating people on this stuff. So it's a great question. I don't know that there's one answer, but there's probably a couple ways that we can begin to approach a solution to that. For sure, dude. Yeah, I, I agree with everything you just said there. And um, so, so speaking of maybe your process here, um, you have something in the book, the the, uh, the P3 model for transformation. Could you dive into that a little bit and explain that? Yeah, of course. So P3 just speaks to the fact that a lot of people have a physical goal, right? They want to look better at the beach or they've got a wedding coming up or, hey, I want to fit into the dress size of what I wore after prom in high school and or, or maybe just a time when they were feeling their best. But we have to realize that our physical goals are lives, largely a, a byproduct of our practices and perceptions in our life, which means what are the behaviors, routines, and rituals that we practice each and every day? And how do we see the world? Because my viewpoint, the way I, I the way my relationship exists with fitness and nutrition, um, you know, so how I feel about exercise, the way I view food, my relationship with food, those things do impact the way that I look externally in the mirror. But most importantly, those health behaviors, those routines and rituals and choices that you make every single day it's almost like when water begins to run through sand over time. And if repeatedly we have a stream there, eventually, uh, you know, it will begin to create uh, essentially that, you know, that carving in the earth. And then eventually you may that stream may become a river if you have that water run over time. And so we need to think about is how these practices impact our physiology, which is basically just the scientific term for our internal health or our metabolism. There's a number of different ways to sort of think about that. But when I begin to understand that when I get adequate sleep, when I nourish my body a certain way, when I train a certain way, that is a 
stimulus and the human body adapts to stimulus. So when I change those practices, like my weight training or like my nutrition, that practice drives the change in the physiology and that change physiology is what leads to the physical goal. So I kind of broke it down. It really ends up being more like, uh, there's like a bonus fourth P in there, but what I encourage people to dial in on is really those practices and perceptions, because whether you're just trying to get healthier from a metabolic perspective, uh, which would be changing your physiology, or if you're trying to look better for a friend's wedding or a family beach trip, or, uh, just fitting into some clothes, you know, from your closet that, that you don't fit into anymore, all of that starts with those daily practices and also our perception or basically our mindset and the way that we are experiencing the world around us. Dude, I love that. And I think that there's so much that people can get out of just this conversation alone. There's certainly so much that people could get out of the book. Um, so if they want to grab a copy, where could they go to, to check this out? Sure. Just head over to metabolismmadesimple.com and uh, it'll take you right to whatever online retailer is going to be best, like kind of patches you through um, via that site. And uh, in the event, you know, if you're listening to this podcast years down the road, I also keep a lot of links on my personal brand site, which is sammillerscience.com. Awesome. And um, is that where the, the best place for people to follow you as uh, Instagram? It's all the same across those. Yeah, platforms. I'm similar science on all platforms. And that book link, you know, is live and, and it is all set to go. You know, sometimes just the way the internet is at times, I'm like, well, you know, hopefully as this gets posted as a podcast, people just keep, you know, going through metabolismmadesimple.com. But I am similar science on Instagram. That's also my podcast and website as well. Um, and the book is available in both a uh, Kindle and also a uh, soft and hardcover format. If you're uh, someone who likes to kind of read the the actual printed paper like I do, um, but I've got a ton of free resources as well. So, you know, hopefully the conversation was valuable. Um, and if they you know feel compelled, can go check out the book, but there's also a ton of places they can start to just get some more information about the concepts that we talked about today. Awesome. Guys, make sure you grab a copy of the book, Metabolism Made Simple, Making Sense of Nutrition to Transform Metabolic Health by Sam Miller. Sam, it was really a pleasure, man. I had a great time chatting with you today. I learned a lot and hopefully the audience did too. I'm sure they, they learned a ton. And uh, really, I appreciate you taking the time to come on the show, man. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate it. All right, buddy. Hang on the line one second.